how are we there? Have we, are we it good? Uh, we're still seeing, um, it's not the full screen view. Did you start the slideshow? There uh, we go. Yeah. That's good. Yep. It takes a couple of minutes, even though, you know, we've been using Zoom for a year now. It's still like, what? Good morning and welcome everybody. We're going to get started in a few minutes, letting everybody join in. We are recording this webinar, so uh, if you want to view it later, it will be up on our YouTube channel, UFIFIS Extension, Manatee County YouTube channel. And if you have any questions, go ahead and use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. We will be answering questions as we go along or saving them towards the end when Maureen, the expert, can answer your ORCID questions. We have about 25 participants so far. Oops. Let's see. For those of you that are on the webinar already, if you'd like to go ahead and just put in the chat where you're joining us from, we'd love to see where you're from. For some of the past webinars, we've had people from all over the state and even out of state. If you have any questions, go ahead and um, what, during the webinar, go ahead and put them in the Q&A rather than the chat. We'd appreciate that. So we're right at 11 o'clock. I want to welcome everyone who joined us this morning for the third in our Master Gardener series on orchids. Welcome. And my name is Kathy Oliver. I'm a program assistant with the Residential Horticulture Program here in Manatee County, UF IFAS Extension, Manatee County. So we're located right in uh, West Central Florida. 
And uh, if you have horticulture questions, no matter where you are in the state, uh, you'll find an extension office in your county. So I encourage you to um, learn more um, using your extension office. And uh, we have uh, programs in a wide variety of agricultural and horticultural areas from commercial to residential homeowner programs. And the Master Gardener program is uh, part of residential horticulture. And our master gardeners are volunteers here at the Extension Office. And they help honor, homeowners with all their gardening and horticulture questions. So today we have with us Maureen Herthler, who's been with our program here for a number of years. And her topic today is advanced orchid care. So I'll let you go ahead and take it away, Maureen. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, yeah, well, good morning, everybody. This is part three of the world of orchids. Um, as Kathy said, if you happen to have missed part one and part two, it will be up on our YouTube channel. Uh, obviously, my name is Maureen and I am a Master Gardener volunteer. Uh, and uh, so let's talk orchids. So our objectives today are to know the when, the why, and how of repotting orchids, and to know common diseases and pests and how to control them. Uh, note that I say control them. Uh, it is uh, difficult to completely eradicate some pests, but you can certainly uh, get them to a point where they're not particularly a problem. I want to start with a disclaimer. I am not an orchid expert. Uh, I get my information that I've, I'm presenting here from some very good sources, predominantly the American Orchid Society. Um, there are newsletters uh, put out by major growers. Uh, Carter and Holmes and Chadwick's happen to be uh, specialists in Cattleyas. Sunset Valley Orchids um, is uh, a nursery that uh, uh, is the uh, world's best in Catacetum. Uh, Neophoenicia, uh, uh, there's Orchid Limited and there's New World Orchids. Um, if you see any brand names during this presentation, they are not recommendations from University of Florida. They are simply present uh, for illustration uh, purposes. All right, repotting. So here's a Cattleya from my greenhouse. Uh, and you can see that the growing edges are creeping up on my little uh, yoga dog. Uh, and there are a lot of surface roots. I mean, it doesn't look the world's best. And this is just a picture of some pests. Uh, we have Waz Duval scale, which uh, gave us a problem in our greenhouse this year, and mealybugs, which give problems to almost everything that we have growing. We're also going to talk a little bit about diseases. Uh, these are two um, affected leaves, and we'll get some um, ideas about what to do for them. And so we're going to move into repotting. Uh, repotting, general repotting season um, just ended. Um, it's usually done in the spring, uh, which for us tends to be February or March, as soon as most of the cold weather is over. And you repot when you see new growth. Uh, the picture shows a catacetum, which is actually dormant during the winter and loses all of its roots. So every spring it grows new roots and it starts to put up uh, a new growth. And there's uh, the instruction for them is to wait until the roots are at least two inches long before you repot them. Uh, and you also want to, you don't want to repot if you have an orchid that's in bud or bloom, uh, because it certainly may compromise uh, the uh, flowering. And most people say you should repot every two years, but there's a lot of flexibility involved in that. One of the reasons that people like to, to repot every two years is because that's when the media that you've potted in starts to break down. And uh, the finer uh, the medium, uh, the uh, poorer the water retention. 
Um, in this picture, um, I hope you can see, but as you move here between the roots, things start to look more like sawdust. Uh, so this, uh, this plant definitely needs uh, some new uh, potting media. Uh, another reason uh, is uh, when your plant is outgrowing its pot. Uh, the first um, slide you see is another Catley of mine um, that has circular roots around the top. Uh, they're all jammed in there. Uh, and this is um, another point where you may want to repot your plants um, again in the spring. The little one that I showed you earlier, or that, no, actually this is the neighbor of the one that I showed you earlier. And this has two growths that are coming out of the pot and you can see two new growths. Uh, so this is another plant that I would repot. And finally, uh, repotting is a good idea when a plant isn't doing well, doesn't look well, or it won't bloom for you after several years. Now, this is another one of uh, my plants. Uh, the outer roots, when I knocked it out of the uh, pot, look really good. In fact, you know, it seems a little crowded. But the inner roots are basically dead. And that may be the problem with this uh, plant. So this is what dead roots look like. They're not green, obviously, when you water them. Uh, the vellum, which is the outer covering, starts to come off and just leaves you with the inner part of the root, which doesn't do anybody any good. Uh, and you know, dead roots um, serve no purpose. Um, they do decompose, but they already are pretty uh, lacking in nutrients. Um, they don't help to hold the orchid in the plant. So. Um, away they go. So at this point in time, there are a lot of choices. Um, there are 28,000 species of orchids and 28,000 opinions on how to raise them. Uh, there are a lot of decisions that you make. And the important part is to find what works for you. Don't hesitate to try different things until uh, you decide you know, what gives you the healthiest orchids. Uh, and yes, the answers to the questions are right, right answers, wrong answers, and it depends. So what do you pot your orchids in? Well, you have to know your cultural needs. Um, you know, does your orchid like to dry out in between? Does it need to stay damp? Uh, and there are general types of potting media, uh, which are predominantly organic, uh, and they uh, contain mixes of bark uh, or coconut husks, moss, tree fern fiber, and there's a special mix for some orchids that are terrestrial. Uh, they also, there, are, there are also inorganic uh, media, uh, such as charcoal, uh, perlite, lava, lava rock, and aliflor, uh, which are absorbent clay balls, and I'll talk to you about them in the future. So, uh, principles of repotting. Uh, before I move into this, there, there are very few uh, orchids that enjoy being in moss in Florida. Moss holds water for a long time, uh, and uh, that leads to a lot of root rot. So I encourage you um, to repot any plants that um, you buy. Uh, to, to replant them in something other than moss as soon as they're done uh, blooming. Uh, orchids come potted in moss because uh, most uh, mass-produced orchids are made overseas. And so uh, you can't really water them on the, on the, on the journey. Uh, but again, um, I view moss as sort of um, uh, a thing that only works for some specialty orchids um, in Florida. So uh, back to repotting. Orchids like to be firmly set in pots. And there are some that actually like to be somewhat root bound. So overpotting is uh, a decision that people make thinking they're not gonna have to repot uh, in the near future, but um, it can be unhealthy for the orchids. Uh, when you 
plant them. They don't wanna be packed in so tight that there's no air, but they certainly don't wanna be wobbly. And we can talk about some ways to make sure they're not wobbly. They do like airflow, but they don't like big pockets of air that you haven't filled with the medium. And mostly with repotting, drainage is everything. You really need to have a number of drainage uh, holes of good size. So what I usually um, use uh, is just a very simple mix. Um, I get some good quality orchid bark that doesn't have any other additives. Uh, a bag of horticultural charcoal, it will say horticultural, and a bag of horticultural perlite, which is basically an inorganic substance. I will dump them all in a tub, uh, mix them up, and that's what I will use to repot um, in an organic type media. Uh, works for me, works pretty well. Pots, pots are a huge choice, a huge decision maker. The basics um, are that your pot has to provide good drainage. It has to be the correct size for the plant. If you're in doubt, go small. Uh, it has to be sturdy uh, because uh, things here in Florida age with the sun pretty quickly. If you're reusing a pot, perhaps a garden uh, clay pot, um, you need to scrub them and then disinfect it by soaking them for, uh, for some time in a very dilute bleach solution and then of course rinsing them very well. Necessary, there are many, many, many choices. This is an example of an excellent uh, uh, plastic pot. Uh, for one thing, it's translucent, so you get an idea of how your roots are doing. It has a raised part in the center, which actually helps to aerate those central roots that have that tendency to die. And this has many, many, many drainage holes on the bottom, on the sides. So this is a terrific uh, pot um, to use here in Florida if you choose to go with plastic. So I do like plastic pots. Uh, and uh, this is sort of the advantages and disadvantages I see with plastic. First of all, they, they do tend to grow algae, although in general, the algae is not a danger to your plant. But I also like the fact that I can see um, how the majority of my outer roots are doing. Um, and here you see some uh, number of you know, bright green, uh, healthy roots. Uh, so that's why I choose plastic. All right, the tools of repotting. Uh, this is my basic repotting kit. Uh, you need uh, bypass pruners um, when you get to the point where you want to start to divide your plants. You need a, a fine nosed pruner uh, for when you're taking off, or snipper I should say, uh, when you're taking off the dead roots, uh, cutting off flower stalks, uh, doing that sort of small general maintenance. You need some packing peanuts and you need real packing peanuts, not the kind of packing peanuts, peanuts that are biodegradable. Um, I have some cinnamon, which is a natural antifungal, uh, which helps on your cut surfaces to protect things. I also have some isopropyl alcohol which is very good for disinfecting all my tools. But as I've gotten uh, more orchids, I use um, a creme brulee or a chef's torch. These are small size, fit in your pocket. Um, this one runs on butane. And to me, it's just so much easier to swipe um, both sides of my blade uh, through um, the hot area of the torch and uh, move on from there. So, how do we replant? So this is a plant of mine, uh, which actually, uh, in, in which I actually want these light green leaves, but you know, they're pretty darn floppy. It's got a new leaf growing in the center, so it's got some health. And this also put out a flower, uh, flower spike, which wasn't doing very well and I'll eventually remove. And once again, with the plastic pots, um, you do get some algae. So you get to scrub that off in the future, but I'm gonna use a clean pot. 
And I'll show you some more pictures of this as we go along. So step one, if your plant has a tag, please, please don't lose it. You can punch a hole in the end and tie it to your plant. Um, but the tags are really important um, as you expand your uh, collection. You're gonna gently, I hope, knock the plant out of pot, of, of the pot. But if it's perhaps in a clay pot and it's not gonna come out, sometimes you just have to break the pot. Uh, and then you're gonna re remove as much of the old media as possible. This is actually fairly easy. Um, you just sort of rub things between your fingers uh, and the old media will fall out. Uh, if it's really attached to some green roots, just go ahead and leave it. Step two is to identify and remove those dead roots. They are most always central and they can be mushy, stringy, uh, dark in appearance. And at the bottom of this plant, you can see some questionable roots as you move toward the top, there are some definite dead roots, but there are also a number of bright uh, green roots. So you wanna save all the good roots that you can, but if you cut one by mistake, it's not a disaster. They are going to be green and most of them will have growing tips, which are of a slightly different color, uh, usually a lighter, a lighter color green or uh, some of them may be red. Uh, so what you're going to go in and do is go in there with those uh, small uh, micro clippers and start taking out all the roots that are obviously dead. If you come to a root that's questionable, just leave it. If you come to one where one part of it is definitely dead, usually the distal part, um, you can cut it back until you see green in the center of a root. Trimming live roots, I said, is not a disaster and some people actually uh, support taking the bottoms off because um, clipping does release a lot of growth factor, factors. Um, but this is the way I do it. Now you've cut all these roots and what are you gonna do? Um, the most common thing is just to dust some, some cinnamon. Uh, you don't have to coat it, but just try and get the, the areas that you might have cut. And uh, it will help, uh, as I said, redu reduce fungus. At this point in time, it's also when you uh, groom your orchids. Uh, many orchids in the Cattleya family produce dry sheets and the uh, pests lo love to bury under there where it's nice and moist. So if you wet your orchid, they come off very easily, but you should um, uh, remove those. If there are any previous flowering stalks that are too long, uh, now you have the opportunity to cut them uh, as close as you can. Uh, with the cattleyas, uh, sometimes there are dead bulbs hanging over the edge in the back and you can remove them. Uh, so there's some cleaning up to do. Well, here we are at step two with that orchid of mine that doesn't look good. Well, I don't know why I um, didn't take it out of moss when it was done blooming, but clearly I did not do that. And it looks okay on the outside. You don't see any roots, which you should with a fowl, but I don't know, it doesn't look terrible. But take off the moss and this is what you find. Um, you know, pretty much all of the roots on this orchid um, are dead. So I know why it's not doing well. Uh, as I said, I take, I'm gonna take off the flower spike because that tends to drain energy from the orchid. So the final picture shows um, when I'm all done trimming the dead roots. And basically on this fowl, I have one live root that's splitting into two. They're healthy roots, they look great, but that's all I have. Step three, uh, it's potting time. So that orchid was in uh, this uh, larger pot, um, uh, five or six inch pot, and I sure don't need that now. So I've gone down to a smaller pot. Um, this may be a three or four inch pot. So I put my orchid in there and there's definitely room for the roots to grow. Um, and then I'm gonna do the actual potting. Uh, you can see immediately that there's gonna be something needed under this orchid to uh, bring it up to the appropriate place to grow. So 
uh, I'll show you this in a minute, step by step. But usually um, when you uh, make media, um, you need to soak it. Uh, I soak mine for 24 hours, you know, 10 or 12 or eight is probably enough and make sure you drain it well. As I said, you've chosen your pot size, smaller is always better. You're gonna put some peanuts, those packing peanuts, not regular peanuts in the bottom. Uh, and you may need uh, to put a little more in to help keep your orchid raised. You cover that with a, just a little bit of media and then you get your plant in position. Uh, you can hold most plants there. If it's big, you might need help. Then you're gonna slowly dribble in media around the roots. And there are a lot of ways to get it down so there aren't there, there are those air pockets. You can use your index finger um, and that's what I do. A lot of people use a pencil eraser, which is a little bit smaller and helps to get the media down uh, really well. This is another reason I like plastic pots because I can see if there are air pockets while I'm repotting this plant. And in between, it's always good to tap it on a hard surface just to help it get settled. So here's my poor miserable plant. <laughs> it's got um, some packing peanuts in it. And I've started to put some media uh, on top of it and I've got it firmly held in position. And then uh, you can see that I've got a little more media uh, around it. Uh, the roots are st still pretty superficial. Um, and uh, if they stay there, that's probably not a bad thing, but I will be able to cover them. Uh, and uh, I do that. And now there's my happy plant with its tag. And you can see just from the one side that's visible, there are no real pockets of air in there. So hopefully it will do better. A lot of people worry with phalaenopsis about these aerial roots and really don't worry about them. Uh, they can stay outside. This is an epiphyte. They're not used to being in media and uh, they'll uh, do just fine. You also see on this phalaenopsis uh, a flower spike or two that haven't been trimmed back and I would trim them back. All right, useful supports. When we talk about your plant does not want to be wobbly. Well, like that last one I did, if you don't have much of a root base, it's gonna be tough for it to stay in the pot. So there are some useful supports. Uh, there are, uh, uh, pot clips. These have a rounded end and are made for plastic pots. They're, they come in various lengths uh, and they will hold a plant in place. So when I get about three quarters uh, of the media in, maybe a little more, I will put the plant clip on or officially it's called a rhizome clip and then continue to pot my plant and that will hold it pretty firmly. Uh, to test, you want to see how much the plant wiggles and you also want to lift it up a bit and see that it's not so tenuous that it will just fall out. Uh, as I said, there are plant clips for every size pot. There are also, there's also a different type of plant support or plant uh, rhizome clip that uh, works for clay pots, but it looks a little bit different. The other is a picture of uh, a cattleya support. Ideally, your cattleyas should go, grow straight up. I have to say mine don't do that. But you can see how this uh, ring, you know, pulled a little bit more snugly around your plants uh, will help it to grow upright. I just briefly wanted to uh, toss in here about semi-hydroponics, which is uh, what you use the expanded clay pellets for. They're a little expensive, but if you have some expensive uh, orchids, uh, they're a nice addition to uh, a potting media. But for semi-hydroponics, uh, you need um, a container. Uh, I'm very fond of uh, Chinese uh, hot and sour soup containers, the big ones and the little ones. Uh, and you need at least two, if not three, uh, large, relatively large, at least quarter inch holes on both sides. 
then you have soaked your, um, I, I'm just gonna go with alifor. You have soaked that um, overnight uh, and it helps to rinse off some of the sawdust. And so that's pretty um, hydrated at this point. And you put it in your pot and you uh, pot it the same way uh, that you would with soil. Uh, and this really, you do a lot of tapping with this, but you know, you just get it in there. And um, a lot of plants really like this. The only drawback is that you have to keep the reservoir at the bottom full. And because this is a completely inorganic media, you also need to keep fertilizer down there. You use very weak fertilizer, uh, quarter strength, um, but it usually needs to be filled every few days. Plus it makes a mess so if you're not outside. Um, but anyway, I'm trying this on a couple of mine now. I've had some good results in the past uh, and we'll see how it goes. All right, so step four. Uh, you mark the month and the year on, back of your, on the back of your plant tag and replace it firmly in the pot or as I said, tie it onto your orchid. If you didn't soak the media, uh, you uh, water it gently. Uh, you don't really have to soak it, just water it gently. And then I put them in partial shade no matter what their requirements are. Uh, not deep shade, but uh, really not much in the way of direct sunlight. Uh, you need to maintain uh, humidity around them. That's really important when you're uh, getting them started. So you may put them on little trays filled with pebbles, uh, you know, something that'll give their microclimate a little more, a uh, little more moisture. And then you gradually move them back to their normal location as soon as you see those center uh, new growth leaves appearing. Um, and here with the Florida sunshine, if you're doing this in any uh, part of the year uh, where we have intense sunlight, like we even have now, make sure that move is pretty gradual. All right, well, we'll take a breather here and then we'll move on to pests. Uh, Maureen? Yes? We do have a couple of questions about repotting in the um, Q&A. Would you like to go ahead and address those? Sure, let's do that before we move on. Okay, um, our first question is on the mix. Do you use equal portions of bark, charcoal, and perlite? Uh, basically, yes. You know, the, the bags are pretty much the same size, but uh, uh, basically, yes. We don't have to measure it, it's not that important. Okay. And then the other one was about uh, the roots growing out of the pot. You mentioned the phalaenopsis. You don't have to worry about those roots mm -hmm. uh, being outside of the pot. But what about other orchids? Do you need to tuck those roots in or is it okay for them to be outside the pot? Uh, well, as we've talked about, orchids are epiphytes. So they don't really need anything around their roots. Uh, the phalaenopsis are really the main ones that produce their, those aerial roots. But for other um, orchids, if I can gently get them into the pot, then I'll do that. But if I can't move them without hurting them, then I just leave them in place. Okay, great. That answers our repotting questions. Uh, and there'll be plenty of time at the end for more. Yeah. All right, so here are pests. Uh, you know, some people say that in Florida we have pest parties, um, but I have pest fiestas. Uh, and orchids can be attacked by all our common uh, growing item uh, pests. Uh, you can have snails, and they like to eat the leaves, as do grasshoppers. Uh, you can have larval caterpillars, which also enjoy uh, leaves and stems. You can have aphids, which are sucking, uh, piercing insects that pull moisture directly out of your leaves. Uh, on a much, uh, a much smaller size are thrips, who kind of uh, act the same way. Uh, you can have scale, all kinds of scale. Um, we saw the picture of the Bois Duval. 
and you know, mealybugs, white fly mites, um, everything can be there. Oh, let me see what I'm doing here. All right, my thing does not want to move. Well, that's not helpful. Let's see what I can do here. All right, so pests. Uh, the most common way to acquire pests is by buying an infected plant. The second most common way is by not sterilizing your tools between plants. So when you um, get a new, new plant, it's, it's good to set it aside for uh, two or three days just to see if it uh, shows any uh, pests. And uh, the main thing to do is to scout daily. Uh, you can see in the corner of Cattleya that uh, those dry sheets had not been removed. And now there's a happy concentration of mealybugs. How do you know if you have pests? Uh, certainly the appearance of leaves, if you have any chewing uh, pests. Uh, sometimes you'll notice that although you have a stalk with buds, the buds just dry up and fall off. You, gener you have a general declining health of your plant, just more and more doesn't look well. Or um, often you can see visible pests uh, like the aphids that we see here on a rose bush. So for pest management, uh, we like to use uh, what's called integrated pest management. And it's based upon this um, triangle. The first thing that we try to do is prevent pests. Um, and, all, and preventing, again, means that isolation when you buy a new one, making sure that your um, tools are sterilized, removing uh, any old leaves or media or those sheets from your growing area, uh, and uh, generally uh, keeping your plants in good health as far as water and fertilizer. Again, there, there are those cultural and sanitation practices. Um, if you have a healthy plant, um, you're going to have uh, fewer pests. And again, it is important to keep your areas clean. There are physical, and mechanical ways, of course, to uh, control pests where you physically remove them or squirt them away with a hose. There are biological controls uh, such as neem oil um, that uh, are truly organic. And then there are chemical controls, which um, are uh, popular things that are recommended like seven or malathion. So uh, for me, the most important thing uh, is to sterilize my tools between plants. I have a lot of orchids. Uh, and this is called the disease triangle. Uh, you have environmental conditions that are favorable to a particular disease. Uh, for example, fungi love humidity. Uh, you have a pathogen that fungus, bacterium, or virus who's just waiting uh, for something to infect. And then you have a host plant that is susceptible uh, to that particular disease. And if you um, eliminate one of them, you'll have uh, much better luck uh, controlling your pests. So here's a little bit more about prevention. Uh, you scout daily for pests, I do. Isolate those new plants don't crowd the plants and have correct growing conditions. Well, when you have a lot of orchids like I do and keep buying more, uh, not crowding the plants becomes an issue. And the experienced orchids, orchid growers say that if you have a cat that can walk between the plants without knocking them over, you're in good shape. I don't have a cat, but... Um, so again, cultural and sanitation, this is just a little more in depth. Um, healthy plants, as we, as, we, as we have talked about, have fewer pests and diseases. Like any growing thing, right plant, right place. You'll uh, hear of people or see people that have uh, orchids lashed to trees that do great and they're in the right place uh, and it's the right plant. You'll have other people who have orchids in pots that don't do well. 
uh, you need to uh, look at your water and fertilization. Uh, you need to keep the plant clean, uh, removing old stems and leaves and flower spikes. And you need to keep your area clean. The physical and mechanical removals, as I said, you can use a jet spray. Often the orchids are a little dainty for this. Um, hand picking, particularly if you see caterpillars or something of that size. And you can also wipe um, aphids and uh, thrips off with um, alcohol, uh, regular rubbing alcohol. Uh, and so that helps quite a bit. There are biological controls. There are natural predators. I know some people in Australia that keep any number of uh, green frogs in their greenhouse. Uh, anoles are actually good. So be happy when you see them. They're predatory insects such as lady beetles. And you can see some here having a feast on uh, aphids. There's the green lacewing, uh, which also um, helps to control pests. And the university is continuing uh, work on finding more uh, natural uh, predators and predatory insects uh, that eventually um, can be released by gardeners uh, to help with the pest control. So all, um, all things that we spray on our plants are chemicals. We don't usually think about um, oil as being a chemical, but it is. And it has the potential to do harm to your plants. So uh, we use the term organic, but um, organic doesn't automatically equal safe. There are a lot of home mixtures of soap and oil uh, and all kinds of things. The problem is, is that the proportions uh, that people give are all over the place. Uh, so we really recommend that you actually purchase a horticultural soap or a horticultural oil. Uh, those are specifically formulated by, for your plants and they're in, everything's in the right proportion. Neem oil is also excellent for controlling pests on orchids. All of these things need repeated treatments and uh, because you're going to read the label, you're going to know how often those treatments need to be applied. There are some other uh, pesticides. Uh, one is spinosad, which um, I like to use when things tend to get a little bit out of control. Uh, and that's a toxic soil bacterium, uh, made from a toxic soil bacterium, excuse me. And then there are pyrethrins, which are derived from chrysanthemums. Uh, both of those two last ones, spinosad and pyrethins, it's easy uh, for the pest to uh, develop resistance. And so those are usually recommended to be uh, used in a cycle. Chemical controls. These are synthetic chemical controls. Uh, serious hobbyists use these all the time on a schedule uh, to uh, protect their plants. Uh, they don't scout, they use these before any uh, infestation. Um, and obviously the commercial growers uh, use these as well. Uh, they use them because orchids are valuable, particularly if you become a collector. Uh, they also use pesticides that go into the media. And as I say, they use them on a regular schedule, um, not through scouting. Uh, before you would use one of these, um, it would help to uh, come and ask a master gardener. Certainly if you go to a garden store, um, they will steer you in this direction. All right, uh, Kathy, do we have any pest questions? No pest questions yet. Okay, well, we do cover a lot of material here. We're gonna talk about diseases. Uh, there are three, three types, just like with us in humans, uh, except for a couple of parasites in humans. But anyway, uh, orchids get fungal diseases, bacterial diseases, and viral diseases. We see here a 
picture of one of the most uh, common that we see in Phalaenopsis, usually from overwatering. This is called crown rot. You can see that the leaves are rotting from the base up. And this is usually a, a fatal problem in uh, Phalaenopsis. Um, there we go. So uh, plants um, may have a similar appearance uh, with all the infections. Uh, so it can be difficult to tell them apart. And all three of them may have similar symptoms, uh, which are uh, un unpleasantly marked leaves, uh, bud, bud blast, et cetera. And we see three here. Uh, one is uh, a good picture of scale, uh, just for comparison. The next is a, uh, is a virus, and the next is a fungus. And we'll look a little bit more closely at those. A lot of these diseases, uh, like I said, can be visually identified, especially um, by master gardeners. Uh, we can use diagnostic labs at the University of Florida. And there, there's a system of home viral testing, uh, which I use. It's a little pricey. Um, I think it's $5 uh, an orchid, uh, but um, you can do it at home. It's easy. And uh, I routinely test ones that I have suspicions about. This is a fungal infection on one of my uh, banda uh, plants. I think it's botrytis. Um, uh, could be something much worse. Um, I will viral test this uh, sometime, but I haven't gotten around to it yet. Fungus treatment. Uh, liquid copper fungicide works great. Um, you just can't use it on dendrobiums, but you can use it on everything else the same way that you would use it on uh, vegetables or any other growing uh, crop. Uh, you just need to be sure to get every leaf uh, upper and lower sides and uh, the uh, uh, center of the plants, uh, the center of the growing plant. Um, and that really is an excellent treatment. Most orchid growers, um, including myself, uh, do use a chemical. It's called Fysin 20. It is advertised as an algicide, fungicide, bactericide, and viricide. Um, they are probably not true. Uh, it's, a very, it's a very good fungicide, uh, decent algicide. Um, and that's what we use. Uh, again, uh, mostly as a foliar spray. All right, this is, whoop, sorry, my, there we go. This is a bacterial infection. You can tell it's a bacterial infection because of all that moisture, it's blistering. And eventually that will uh, extend through your leaf and make it uh, rather mushy. Okay, I don't know why I'm here in fungus treatment, please, oh. I'm sorry, my little thing isn't working and I'm going all over the place. All right, so the bacterial treatment, uh, orchid growers like Fysan. You physically remove as much disease as possible, even if it's the whole leaf. And then, as I said, we'll use Fysan as um, a foliar spray. Uh, other than that, for bacterial infections, um, you really need to go up the ladder with uh, control. And I would definitely come and talk to a master gardener about that. Viral infection. The way to tell um, on the flowers about a viral infection is what's called color break. And you can see here that this uh, lovely uh, purple orchid, um, the petals and the sepals are, the colors just all chopped up in a random pattern. Uh, the lip itself is involved. Um, and this is sort of uh, when I would home test that orchid uh, to see if it was carrying a virus. Treatment for viruses, unfortunately, um, involve uh, throwing the whole thing away. All right, I'm gonna show you a couple uh, diseased plants here or abnormal uh, leaves. Um, we have uh, one in the corner, uh, obviously, 
we have a squiggly one, um, we have uh, a little bumpy one, and then we have one with a big brown spot. So let's look at this one. Uh, this, is, uh, this is pretty mushy. Uh, if you touch it and it exudes water or something along those lines, it's um, probably bacterial. This one is a mosaic virus, um, which we see in a lot of uh, plants. Uh, that appearance um, means you should get that orchid out of the grow area as quickly as possible and dispose of it. This is another uh, thing that we see, uh, which are mites. Mites are very difficult to get rid of. Um, and you will be using uh, spinosad and pyrethmins probably alternating. Oh, and finally, we have this. This is an interesting one. It doesn't really look like any of the pictures that we've seen before, uh, but uh, this is sunburn. And uh, uh, it's not uncommon uh, to get sunburn. I continue to get one sunburned while I try and put them in the right uh, place. It doesn't harm the orchid uh, in the sense of killing the whole orchid, but it does make for an, an un- uh, an un, uh, unhappy looking leaf, and you can just cut that off. So uh, here's some pictures from our educational garden greenhouse. Uh, Helen uh, Pausenstein is, in, head of, is a, in charge of that, and she does an absolutely wonderful job. Uh, we see a nice violet phalaenopsis. And this is actually a show quality phalaenopsis. The, uh, Flowers are a nice size. They're all the same. They're arranged on opposite sides of uh, the flower spike, which will be one of those great drooping spikes. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, there is a little pink phalaenopsis here. Um, uh, many of our things are unnamed, but it's another one that's beautiful. Uh, this white um, tatley across is a little bit past its prime. But uh, again, this is beautiful, all white with just that yellow throat and it has a wonderful fragrance. Um, another Cattleya we have is this uh, pretty little uh, yellow and pink one. Um, again, I, I don't know the name of this. And finally, we had this um, incredible uh, Lelia. Uh, I think it's going to be Lelia purpura, uh, which uh, was in bloom. Uh, this uh, this spring. So, you know, don't hesitate to come by and visit us and see what's uh, blooming in the gr greenhouse. This is my greenhouse. My wonderful husband just finished it for me. Uh, so I have, um, uh, I still have enough room for plants mostly. You can see uh, toward the front that I've got some yellowing leaves on what's, uh, what's called a bulbophyllum. And um, that's sort of natural. And this plant is natural in many plants as they get older, they simply uh, drop their leaves. So uh, some of the things that I've had in bloom is uh, this uh, really interesting plant called Coelogyne mayeriana. If you were uh, present for the first uh, orchid uh, webinar, uh, you will notice that this is a species orchid. That is, it hasn't been crossed with anything. This is the original uh, species of the orchid. Uh, it was beautiful, it had two big spikes, um, 14 flowers, uh, probably uh, two or three inches across. Uh, and that worked out very well this year. This is Brassavola digbiana, again, uh, a, a species, pure species. This is the parent plant for hundreds of crosses. And uh, it has this wonderful little uh, fimbriated edge all around it. Um, it has a slight fragrance, but really nothing that you would notice. Off to the background, a little blurry, but you can see um, my Maxillaria tenufola, which is the coconut orchid, uh, growing extremely well in uh, hydroponics. It had two flowers this year, which um, did smell like coconut. Um, they lasted quite a while. This is um, a Japanese style orchid called Fukura. Uh, it, uh, they are the samurai orchids uh, that uh, 
samurai used to bring with them on visits to other samurai. Uh, they can be very expensive or they can be really inexpensive to get started with. This is uh, Yodomatsu and this is the first, they're all, uh, they all crosses of Neo-Phoenicia falcata. So Neo-Phoenicia falcata is the uh, genus and species name, uh, but then there are these original uh, hybrids, first hybrids. Uh, this is the first time that Yodonomatsu bloomed for me, so I was very pleased. Um, and I do grow these in moss. Uh, that's a traditional a Japanese way, but I also mount some, uh, and uh, you can really, you know, you can really grow them in anything. With moss, um, I do have to be careful of how much water they get. Well, and this is a little beauty that came out today. Again, you can see it in semi-hydroponics. One of the great fun, one of the fun things about going to orchid shows um, is that there are so many vendors. Uh, this was part of a deal that I got from Carmela Orchids in, in Hawaii. And I got it at the Sarasota Orchid Show. So these were a little bit older than seedlings, maybe a year old plants. Uh, and they were all hybrids, uh, sometimes hybrids of hybrids, but they didn't know what the original plant, what the, uh, what the plant would finally look like when it bloomed. So, you know, I got a great deal, you know, five for $15 or something and uh, put them in the greenhouse and uh, they're finally old enough uh, to maybe two and a half years old and uh, they're starting to bloom. So, uh, this one, like I said, is a, a hybrid of a hybrid, uh, and the other ones may turn out to be completely different. Uh, then the orchid grower selects the best of the siblings, and that's the one that he'll use, uh, or he or she will use for propagation uh, or uh, making crosses. The other ones uh, are nice, um, and they may or may not continue to breed them. All right. Um, I am ready for more questions. Okay, oh, great. Yeah. If anyone has any questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A and we'll get started addressing those. We do have a couple already. Maureen and uh, Denise would like to know if there's any chance of bringing a crown rot orchid back to life. No, there really isn't. Uh, once the crown is rotted, that's the growing point for the orchid. Um, and there really isn't any way to salvage those. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, Monique says she had flowers uh, that had very small black spots on them. Do you know what that could be? Uh, it, it may be natural for the flowers, although we don't usually see black spots. Uh, if the plant itself looks healthy, uh, then I would suspect that it is a fungus of some sort. And particularly if there was a dropping of closed buds. Um, but initially, uh, once that uh, flower spike is finished and you remove it, I would simply uh, start to treat the plant with a fungicide. And for a phalaenopsis, um, copper will be just fine. Okay, Patricia would like to know, how do you re repot dendrobiums that are pot bound into baskets? Uh, well, dendrobiums love to be pot bound uh, and they don't like to be repotted. So uh, I only repot dendrobiums when they're really growing out of the pot. Um, but I have to confess that um, dendrobiums and I have an adversarial relationship. As far as putting a dendrobium in a basket, if you have 
a small enough basket um, that you can uh, in some way crowd the roots, um, then that will be, um, then that will probably work. But uh, most people don't put their dendrobiums in baskets. However, dendrobiums do like to be attached to trees. Uh, so again, the importance here though, is that they, they really like to be root bound. Good tip. Oh, uh, do you have any thoughts on Super Thrive? I think you may have covered that in a previous webinar. There are any number of growth hormone type uh, concoctions out there. Super Thrive has had a lot of testing um, and I use Super Thrive. It's very important though, to stick to the one drop per gallon. So um, you have to do that. Um, and I use that with every feeding. Uh, there are other ones out there that some orchid growers like. Uh, Mega Thrive is one, uh, Dynagro. And uh, the thing about Su Super Thrive is that it also has a lot of vitamins in it, whether uh, the orchids need those or not, probably. Uh, so again, you can do without it um, and, and or you can try it or another one. Uh, just follow the directions and see if it gives you a better quality plant. Great, okay. Uh, Steve has read that um, Epsom salts uh, can be used as a remedy for pests and diseases. What do you think about that? Well, that falls into that, you know, 28,000 uh, different um, opinions. Magnesium, or yeah, Epsom salts are primarily magnesium. So its contribution is toward uh, a healthy plant. Uh, it doesn't particularly do anything about um, pests or uh, diseases other than help your plant to be strong. Again, because of uh, the uncertainty about the composition or uh, the concentration, uh, most of us use uh, plain uh, CalMag, which has calcium and magnesium in it, um, and include that in our watering schedule maybe once a month. Uh, so if you uh, want to use a magnesium uh, supplement, I would encourage you to use um, the CalMag. Okay. Heather asks, can it be beneficial to soak an orchid and the roots while repotting? And someone used tea and another person used Super Thrive, I think or thrive. Okay. That's, a, that's a tough one. Um, soaking is helpful if you're having trouble telling um, healthy roots uh, from unhealthy roots because with water, the healthy roots will turn very green. As far as soaking the orchids, um, I certainly would not recommend tea. Uh, if you want to soak the roots uh, or the orchid itself in Super Thrive, again, make sure you have the right concentration. Too much Super, super Thrive will kill your uh, roots. Uh, the other thing, what I do is uh, use Fysan 20. Uh, and after I prune all the roots off, I will spray uh, the plant, the whole plant, and the root ball with Fysen 20, and then repot. Yes, you can soak in Fysen 20, again, uh, using the right concentrations. Uh, since most of the media uh, comes uh, somewhat moist, um, or if it doesn't, you're going to uh, uh, wet it yourself. You really don't need to water an orchid after it's, uh, after it's potted. Uh, so, yeah, so that's a tough question. Uh, some people recommend soaking your uh, Vanda orchids, uh, you know, once a week or something, but uh, soaking is something you don't have to do. Uh, sometimes it causes more problems uh, because you have to change the water between soaking each orchid. 
and so I said, I use the foliar spray now because um, again, it's just part of my potting routine. Okay, uh, Melanie has a couple of questions. What kind of orchids can better tolerate periods of full sun? And do you have any advice on moving from a plastic orchid pot to mounting on a tree, uh, specifically a dendrobium, or are there some types that are better for mounting than others? Oh, all right, Kathy, what was the first one there? Uh, what orchids can tolerate a full sun? Okay. Uh, in Florida, there are no orchids that tolerate full sun. Uh, Vandas like period of very bright light. Uh, they need the most sun of what we're probably going to be growing here. So they should probably, they do best with unobstructive east light. So directly in the sun uh, when it's in the east. Uh, after that, they should have, uh, you know, partial shade, uh, maybe a little, you know, a little bit sunny, but they need to be protected from the summer sun. Uh, most people around here use a 50% shade cloth um, over their vandas, uh, particularly midday. Uh, what was number two? And with more sun comes more water too, correct? correct. For vandas especially. Yeah, I water my vandas every day uh, and in the heat of the summer, twice a day, so yes. The other question was moving an orchid from a plastic pot to mounting on a tree. I love mounting uh, my orchids because again, I can just spray them every day and not worry about them getting uh, root rot. Uh, most orchids, any orchid really uh, is perfectly happy uh, uh, mounted on a tree um, as long as it gets the appropriate amount of sunlight. So Phalaenopsis are a shady orchid. Um, so you really need to put them in uh, a shady area. Uh, um, if you use the American Orchid Society culture sheets, they will tell you exactly how much your uh, orchid light your orchid needs in foot candles and then there's a simple app on uh, in the that you can use on your phone to measure uh, so it's really the same same process uh, take them out of the pots uh, trim off any dead roots you know sheets anything else that might uh, might uh, interfere with their growth uh, and uh, if you want to, at this point, use an antifungal or whatever, that's fine. Uh, and then you just mount them to the tree. Uh, again, they have to be really tight against the tree. Uh, what many people recommend is using old pantyhose, if you happen to have some around, because we don't have any need for that, um, and wrapping them very tightly around the tree and then leaving that until it starts to grow into the tree. Or, um, you know, you can use anything. Uh, you can use a little bit of sphagnum moss uh, and then put fishing, wire, fishing line over that. Uh, you don't want to put fishing line directly on its roots. Uh, but um, as long as, like I said, as long as it's snug against the tree, and that includes the roots and the plant itself somewhat, uh, in the right place, they should do just fine. Okay, great. Uh, Nan says she has little spots on uh, her orchid flowers, probably from too much rain, but it blooms every year. Other than aesthetics, is it okay to leave the, flower, the spotted flowers on or should she treat it with something? And these are orchids that are attached to pygmy date palms. Uh, okay, well, Black spots, you know, on flowers or whatever, again, um, are somewhat difficult to diagnose. But if you are seeing it more when it rains or when it's very humid, then um, it's most likely this is a fungus. Uh, your decision to treat 
um, is purely up to you. As I said, it's very hard to eliminate diseases and pests, but you can control them. Uh, if it's a problem for you, you can treat the plant with the fungicide uh, when the flower stalk is done and you've cut it off. Um, it probably won't help you to treat it now as far as the blooms are concerned, but put it on a regular treatment uh, and uh, see what happens next year. Okay. Um, Heather's daughter is watching with her and she would like to know if you have a favorite orchid. A favorite orchid, boy. That's a tough one, huh? Yeah, I think I have uh, favorite types of orchids. If mm -hmm. I had to pick one, um, I showed some, uh, some pictures of uh, my neighbors last week, uh, which is called um, uh, Sogo Yuki yeah, Yuki can uh, V3. It's a phalaenopsis, it's easy to grow. Um, it just puts out huge sprays of gorgeous white flowers. Uh, for, so for a plant that's uh, pretty reliable to grow, that really puts on a show, um, that's one of my favorites. Um, and then uh, I do like ones that are fragrant. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, I have a Wanagara apple blossom, which really fills the entire house with an absolutely gorgeous fragrance. So um, those are two of my favorites. Wonderful. Okay, how about um, nutrients with semi hydro? Uh, what are your what are your nutrient favorite nutrients to use in that case? Uh, I use my regular orchid uh, fertilizer um, at quarter strength, um, and I use an MSU fertilizer. But um, any uh, fertilizer that is balanced, um, even a 10-10-10, uh, is perfectly fine. Uh, there are any number of different formulations, but for the main part of fertilization, the first number, the nitrogen should be the highest. And then the phosphorus and uh, potassium uh, can be in several different um, proportions, but usually the, uh, yeah, the phosphorus, the phosphate is a little bit higher. Uh, so I use those quarter strength and I pretty much refill them every other day. When it becomes time for them to bloom, I switch to uh, a lower nitrogen formula and again, uh, dilute it and put that in there every other day, sometimes every two days. Okay, good. Uh, Lori says her daughter has several orchids that she grows inside her home. She has them in small ceramic pots with drains and waters them in her kitchen sink. Once she has done this and allowed them to completely drain, she doesn't put them back in their original home. She moves them to a new location where a previous orchid was. Is this a good idea? So these are inside her home. Yeah, first of all, the culture is excellent. Uh, most indoor orchids are gonna be Phalaenopsis and I do recommend uh, taking the pot and soaking it uh, for uh, five minutes is fine. Um, usually every two weeks. Uh, and uh, I mean, that, that really is excellent Phalaenopsis culture, assuming they're not in moss. Um, as to whether you can move them around. Uh, you know, orchids, orchids get picky. Uh, and I don't move mine unless uh, they're in bloom and I bring them inside. And even sometimes they don't like that. I think if your uh, conditions are the same or close to the same, then you're fine. Uh, but I wouldn't move it um, where the uh, available light was um, much different unless you wanted to do that gradually over time. But yeah, congratulations on the right culture there. Uh, we had another comment in the chat that um, uh, one of the participants says she has had great success with semi-hydroponics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's um, one of the things that all of us, I think, in Florida are looking for 
is a way to handle water uh, because in the winter season, it's dry and you need to do things to try and increase humidity because orchids usually like about 60% humidity. But in the summer, um, you know, the humidity is deadly, particularly at night. So uh, semi-hydroponics uh, gives you a way to avoid overwatering. And uh, because it drains so easily, um, it doesn't give you issues with heavy rain. And the microclimate, because of the expanded uh, clay pellets, is actually um, a little more humid than anywhere else. So uh, yeah, you know, it, it comes in and out of phase. Um, but um, yeah, again, uh, people have really good success with it, particularly here in Florida. And our last question is, where do you get your plastic orchid pots? Uh, there are a number of uh, excellent online vendors. Uh, and um, uh, I can give you, you know, a couple choices. Uh, one is a place called Kelly's Corner, uh, Kelly with a K uh, and an E. Uh, they, they have a huge selection of plastic pots, uh, all, of which are, all of which are excellent. Excuse the doggy here. Um, another one is called Repot Me. They also have a big selection. Um, and those are the two places that I get mine from. I'm sure there are other, uh, other places as well. Well, it must be lunchtime. It is. <laughs> um, I wanted to remind everybody that if you have more questions, you can always email the Manatee County Master Gardener volunteers. And I did put our email in the chat. And um, those orchid questions will come to Maureen if you mention that uh, you watched the webinar and had additional questions. And also we do record our webinars and um, they are posted on our YouTube channel and that's also in the chat as well. And Maureen, lots of good comments. Thank you very much. Uh, much appreciated with all the great information. And uh, I want to thank everyone else for joining us too. So um, with that, we will go ahead and sign off well, from the webinar. Well, thank you as well, Kathy, for the opportunity. And thanks for um, everybody who tuned in. Thanks. We love ha having you, Maureen. Thank you. Great job. Bye, everyone. <laughs>